We've got a couple mowers here this morning. Customers have brought in and say they won't start. They've both got Briggs and Stratton single cylinder Intec engines on them. So this is an LA125. And then the other one looks like this is a 21 horse. It's rated. The other one's a YT3000 Craftsman over here. Doesn't look like there's any rating actually on the engine on this, but probably somewhere in that 19 to 21 horse range. Some of them are rated a little bit lower at like a 17 and a half or something like that. This one, we originally went to try and start it up. The battery is, you know, from this year, but it's only got nine volts to it. We're gonna throw a charger on it real quick, see if we can't get it to turn over and figure out exactly what's going on. You always wanna make sure that the battery connections are tight at the battery. If they're not tight at the battery, it's not gonna work for you. A lot of times the voltage will jump. Also at the solenoid on this, the solenoid on the other side. If any of these wires are loose, you won't get good voltage to the starter. The starter's on the other side. We'll look at that a little bit closer, but you also wanna make sure that wire is nice and tight and then the ground wire on this one it's right here it's just if you follow the negative from the battery down to the frame on this it's right up front on some of the other ones they are uh, if the battery's in the back they'll be attached to the frame in the back maybe i'll show you that on this yt3000 it looks like it is in the back wanted to get a little better view of the starter right there on that connection Make sure that's tight and then the solenoid a little better view here all those connections should be tight including the two going to the coil of the solenoid which are the two smaller ones if those are loose sometimes it just won't get enough voltage through to draw the solenoid down and sometimes you'll get kind of a clicking out of it or something if that's the case or if that ground wire we were talking about is bad you can kind of see it way down in there on the other side just where your negative comes back and connects to either the engine or the frame. Now it looks like we're getting 15.18 volts. Got it on a 40 amp charge. Let's see what happens as we go to start it. I'm smelling a bunch of gas right now. Take my flashlight out of there. Smelling a bunch of gas as I'm trying to turn it over. One of the first things <clears throat> I'd like to do beyond that, since it is turning over now, we didn't really know if it was a non-start issue caused from an electrical issue uh, because the battery was dead. Maybe they left a key or something on after they tried to start it. But first we had to get this battery charged or jumped in order to get the mower to turn over. Let's jump back a little bit. The next thing I always like to do is go ahead and check the spark. We can come to the plug in the front. Get a little closer. I've got a spark checker here. If you don't, you can pull it out and you can hold it against the uh, side with either like a rag or a different spark plug either way and just make sure you're getting a spark. If you pull the wires on there you've got an extra spark plug and really just kind of hold it to the side I just like to hold it up against just the metal anywhere you can and see if you get a spark in between the tip and the probe on the outside if you do you know it's a good spark if you don't you know you don't have anything it looks kind of like a new plug already in there See what it says. It says absolutely nothing. We're getting no spark out of it whatsoever. Let's go ahead and take the plug that's in there out. Definitely wet. Doesn't look real old, but definitely not brand new. Throw a new one in it. 
never hurts to start with something simple it's never the spark plug for the most part but you never know sometimes it is just really that easy probably not the case Now you can also use like an inline checker or anything like that. They're pretty cheap or if you have one laying around, see what it looks like. And we still get no spark whatsoever out of our spark checker. Seems like the engine is turning over pretty well. So I don't think, I think the battery was probably just ran dead by them. Once we get started or whatever, we can check the charging system. But at this point, it's looking like we either have a bad safety that's killing it or a bad coil one or the other now one of the easiest ways to test this is to come over to the side and you find the kill wire and everything hooking up to the engine now in this case on these intex if you follow it around it'll actually be the black wire coming out so this thing's only got four wires hooked up two of them are for the charging system one is for the carburetor to power it to power the solenoid on the bottom and the other one's for the kill wire on the coil now if you disconnect all of this that disconnects the engine completely from the electrical system of the tractor does not keep you from turning over the starter because everything there is still hooked up as far as the starting system goes now, if you're going to do something like this, you want to make sure that the spark plug is out and you'll test it against the block just so it doesn't start if the issue is a kill. So if there's an issue with the electrical system or one of the safety switches or something over here and it's still turning over, but you're not getting spark. If we disconnect this and go to start it, it's going to fire up. Now, the solenoid is not being powered at this point. So it's, it's not 100% guaranteed to, to start because it's blocking off the fuel, but a lot of times they will turn over and start, so be careful with that. Now with that disconnected, let's see what kind of spark we get. Now again, be very careful when doing that just in case you get an accidental start. No spark still. This is telling me that even when nothing is killing out my kill wire for my solenoid, I'm still not getting a spark. Most likely a bad coil at this point, but we're gonna take it apart further and figure it out. Now at this point, if you're getting spark, but you're still not getting fire out of it, you can check further by spraying some starting fluid in the intake. Move your air filter. And all you would do is just spray a little bit of either starting fluid or carbon choke cleaner. It's all kind of the same as far as being combustible and able to start something. Just spray a little down in the intake. It doesn't take a whole lot, but just a good, you know, second and a half or so spray just to give it a little bit of fuel and try firing it up at that point. If it does start at that point, you know that the problem is you're not getting good fuel or you're not getting a fuel supply at all. Either a fuel quality problem you know some restriction in the line restriction from the pickup in the tank or anywhere coming through fuel pump not working uh carburetor issue also a solenoid issue now on the solenoid on the bottom of the carburetor i've got an auxiliary one here just for show i'm going to plug in but as you engage as you turn the key to your mower that solenoid is supposed to drop down i've still got it unplugged on the other side let me plug that back in wondering what was going on <laughs> thinking maybe my my one I had wasn't working but it looks to be so when you turn the key off the plunger comes up and turns fuel supply off to your mower when you turn the key to on and it engages the solenoid powers and it draws in to allow fuel into your mower this is the way pretty much all small engine fuel solenoids work in and out as long as it's moving up and down like that your solenoid is solid if you're moving it around with the wires and it keeps jumping around though or you can contort this and and it jumps in and out you probably have an issue with either the wire or the solenoid itself as far as the connection goes we'll see if this one i know we're getting voltage to it but i haven't really checked to see i mean that one feels good you can 
You can feel it or hear it if you actually listen for it, if it's quiet in the place you are, clicking in and out as you're turning on and off. That should tell you at this point whether you're getting, whether you're missing spark or you're missing fuel from the equation. Here's a little better view of the fuel solenoid. The key's off right now. We're going to send it power. Now it's on, off, on, off. And again, all this does is the jet straight through the bottom. It goes and plugs that jet up when it's turned off. Stops the fuel. As soon as you power that solenoid again, it drops down and allows the fuel into the main jet. Now, these will get stuck in the up position a lot of times because that's where they're at when they're off and that'll stop the fuel supply. Now, if it's all gummed up through there, it doesn't return like this, you would want to clean everything through here and work it in and out until it was freely moving. And that would solve your problem. You can check the fuel supply here by removing it. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll grab a glass jar or something to drain it into and pull it off. And as soon as you turn this mower over with this off again usually into a glass jar if you if you grab and twist fuel lines first it kind of breaks the seal and then you're able to pull them off without ripping them now it seems like we're getting fuel it looks like good quality fuel but it's hard to tell if you pump some into like a glass jar you can look for any separation a lot of times the fuel and the water will separate out if it's not good quality fuel now if i just barely hit if I just barely hit that over, we're getting a good fuel supply. Don't try that at home. You don't want fuel spilling everywhere. Be prepared for it to come out. Doesn't smell like bad fuel. Again, we're, we have a no start issue here. So I don't think we have any issue with the fuel. But it's always good to check anyway because if I say, hey, you just need a coil. It may run into another issue beyond that. You know, if I were to pull that out and see a bunch of yellow gas, I would know right away. That we probably have a carb issue or are going to need some further things and i can let the customer know about that right away as opposed to later now at this point if you've checked and you know you have fuel and you know that you have spark out of your spark plug given an auxiliary fuel or something you know you have fuel go ahead and pull the valve cover off at this point now it's just held on by four three eight bolts and it pulls straight off sometimes it'll have seal it around it so you'll have to kind of pry with a screwdriver to get it off but most of the time they come off halfway decent even if not especially if they have the gasket material now when what you're looking for in here is you're going to want to make sure all this has action to it now i don't know if this engine will actually spin to be quite honest with you it's got catastrophic failure to it you know, so it will not but as your engine spins these push rods will move in and out, which in turn opens your valves up. Now, if any of these push rods are bent or broken or anything like that, you're going to want to address that. There are a couple little pushers here. And both of these push rods look fine, which is kind of surprising. That one's a little wore down. You can tell it's been ran low on oil that way. But anyway, you're looking for the action in and out of these valves, and they should both come back out exactly the same level. These should sit level when they're both out. Now, if everything here is good, none of this is backed out, that's all good, that's fine. You know, you can also check by sticking something in the spark plug hole and seeing when you're turning in the engine if the piston's actually moving up and down. If someone would have done that in this case, as soon as they tried to move it, they would have noticed it doesn't move. And then from there, it's got a big gaping hole in the side of it. Catastrophic failure where the rod came through the side. Anyway, that should tell you at this point, you know, if you're getting the spark and you're getting the fuel, you've got to have timing off of some sort. So either the piston can't be moving up and down, one of the valves is sticking, something's going on. The head gasket could also be blown completely out. That could happen. This is just a junk engine we're throwing away. That's the only reason I'm kind of bending it all up here. We're going to take the other thing to look at is going to be your flywheel key. Now, if you just take the 15 16 off the top, 
you can pull all this out. But even from the top, you should be able to see and move this around enough to see if your key is lined up. Now here the key's lined up well. I'm just gonna get that nice flashlight on there. The key's lined up well, it's intact, but sometimes they'll spin and the timing will be off. That'll cause it not to start also, even if you're getting spark and fuel, depending on where the timing's set at that point. Now, normally a head gasket won't be blown out enough not to make it start, but it is possible. And if that's the case, nine times out of 10, if you look right around where the head bolts on, where the two pieces come apart here, there's going to be a lot of oil buildup like this, and it's going to be real dark, or you're going to see some burn marks somewhere if you're inspecting it. Pay attention to that if, if you're thinking that that's the case, if there's nothing else possible that you see. And also check your valve spacing while you're in here. So everything's good with your valves. You've checked everything else. You know, set this engine to top dead center. Uh, just barely past, quarter inch past where it goes back down in. And go ahead and set your, set your valves. You can also, with this engine, you can set it with one valve completely in. The other one will be completely out on these engines. So if you're turning the engine and this valve's completely pushed in, you can set the valve spacing here. Uh, on these, I believe it's uh, five and seven thousandths, uh, five thousandths on the intake, seven thousandths on exhaust. It might be four thousandths and six thousandths. Look it up depending on your engine. Set that if that could be the case. Now there are four three-eighths bolts. So three-eighths here, here, and then one at the back corner and one at the back corner here. Now the back two have a little bit different flange than the front two. Those are the back two and those are the front two. And then we've got a couple that hold the fuel pump on. The longer one goes towards the bottom of the fuel pump here on the back. The smaller one goes on the top. And then there is a Phillips head screw that goes straight down through right behind this air cleaner. Now everything's off and this all just pulls straight up and off at that point. Now when it goes back together, you do have to make sure the notch here is lined up in here and then along with the other piece not gonna worry too much more about that right now let's see I'll get to the other side and see what the coil wire looks like now the coil wire plugs into the bottom of the coil here and it just runs down through and then to this connection that we unplugged one time before now it looks like it's kind of against it, but let's go ahead and unplug this coil wire. Now that cannot kill the coil at this point. You want to make sure that you're not trying to start this, that the spark plug is not hooked up, that you're testing it without the spark plug hooked up at this point. Otherwise it could start and not turn off uh, in a rare case. I am going to Put my spark plug tester on now it looks like it may have been pinched right here when somebody put it together in between the top and the top cover and that may be a, what has caused our issue and maybe caused the failure normally it's supposed to go through under here that way it doesn't hit so probably the last time somebody had this apart this possibly happened get this out of the way make sure everything's free so we still have nothing as far as the spark goes which means at this point this coil is bad now there is nothing else that can cause this as long as you have a gap between the coil and the magnet one easy way to figure that out is if you just shine a flashlight directly behind it you should be able to see light in between the coil and the magnet if you were to shine a flashlight just directly under and look down through, you should be able to see that as the magnet comes around here. The surface rust, if there's anything huge on it or you, it's like scales or anything like that, you can sand it off. Other than that, it's not going to uh, intersect any, any at all with the magnetic field of the coil. It almost looks kind of burnt right here. There's a little, I don't know, piece of some varnish or something that's melted. We're going to get a coil ordered. For this one, to get this thing fixed, that should take care of it. Let's check out the YT3000. 
The first thing we notice as we're checking it is that the battery cables were loose. We went ahead and tightened those up and we checked the ground wire. The ground wire on this, you could follow the negative down and it'd show you where it goes. I'm going to go right down to the bottom and show you that that is where it connects. So the wire goes up to the battery negative. Now if that's all corroded or it's loose or anything like that, that's not going to give you a good connection for this thing to start and you may run into some issue like that. The battery is fully charged. I think it's got like 12, I don't know, 12 and a half or 13 volts. Somewhere in there. Let's try to fire it up and see what happens. Okay, so we have nothing basically at that point. One thing I like to do first is come over and check out our solenoid. You can check voltage here back to the ground. Now this terminal right on this side that goes directly back to the battery. So if you were to check volts DC on here and check back to ground you should be getting the full voltage that you were at the battery. So 12.76. We know we're getting voltage to the main leg of the ignition. Uh, I'm sorry, the coil. And that is, in turn, should be feeding the whole unit voltage. Now there is a fuse on this one. It's on the bottom side. You can pull it, just kind of clips to the inside. And pull it and check it. Now that looks great, no problems. Got it. I'm gonna put it right back where it was. And then the next thing we're gonna check, so we know we're getting good voltage basically to the whole mower at this point. The thing that's not working is the starter. Do we have a bad starter? Well, I don't know, it's hard telling without testing further, but it, you could jump these solenoid posts if you wanted to check the starter. Now be careful, because it is live voltage. You want to use something insulated that way you don't get hurt but if you're to touch these two if the starter is good it should try to turn over just like that now you'd want to make sure it's off you want to make sure you're in a safe area if you're going to do something like that that way you don't get hurt so things don't happen but you can test that starter pretty easily like that we know the starter is good we know we're getting voltage here and everywhere through now the question is why isn't it starting well the solenoid here there's two wires that go to it these provide 12 volts or whatever your battery voltage is to the solenoid in order to energize the starter. If they're not getting 12 volts, you're not going to energize. If they are getting 12 volts, we know the solenoid's bad. If it's not getting 12 volts, we know we have a safety switch or something else going on. Bad wire or anything like that. Now I've got the obviously the brake locked in here because it will start with the brake locked in. Some units you do have to be sitting on the seat. So you'll have to look up the the exact model but if you're able to start your unit with just your parking brake locked in like most of them are these tests work just like i'm doing it otherwise you may have to look at somebody sitting to help you or bypass the seat switch for testing purposes as i turn the key here i'm getting 12.54 volts to my solenoid that means when i turn this key this energy from this side, this post, should be coming to this post because all that does, it's a coil that pulls the, it pulls a, a metal plate down that attaches those two or pulls it up that attaches those two. And that's all it does, just like I did with my knife here as I attach those two solenoid posts, just like that. Now, we know at this point the solenoid is bad. We know all of our safety switches are working because we're getting voltage here. All we need to do is replace this solenoid. No big deal whatsoever. Pretty easy task, really cheap fix, and that solves all of our problems. At this point, if you're not getting power to the solenoid, you'll want to check the safety switches. Now, as you look down in the bottom, straight over to the far side, is where you see the brake switch, right on that far side. Now that switch is, you can unplug it and test the post coming up through. 
down at the bottom and then there's one straight up through here if you follow those wires and that's for your PTO switch so when you swing the PTO up the switch engages or disengages the fuel tank will have to be removed to check that one and on this one the brake switch in back is right here sits right below the bottom side and then you've also got the seat switch which is up underneath the seat of course I'm going to show you how to check all of these if your mower is so equipped with them there are many different types of safety switches but they all work exactly the same way if you have a plunger switch just like a standard switch something like this for the brake or for the PTO so this one it's a little bit easier to see it sits right here actually see if I can't get a little bit of light up in there now this PTO switch here if we unplug it we can test it and we're just going to test the pair so it's no different than this one here if you look at them this says NC on this tab which means that this pair this horizontal pair this one and this one are normally closed when the plunger is out in normal state this connection is closed which means if we take our meter we can set it to let's reset we can set it to ohms and we should basically be getting an infinity ohms reading on the opposite one and we should be getting like close to a zero ohm reading between here and here so we're testing between themselves see how we get zero ohms it means there's a solid connection there's almost no resistance between there now when i push the plunger after that these pairs i'm not sure why it's jumping around like that these pairs go to overload or infinity meaning they're not connected at all so it should be close to close to zero ohms when you're hitting those two connections. And then the other pair is gonna be opposite. It's gonna be normally open. So you're gonna show infinity on it between these two until you push it. And then you're gonna show your zero ohms or close to zero ohms as you're pushing it. This is working correctly. You can do that with all of the switches. There's, you know, again, there's the PTO switch. It works the same. It's the horizontal pairs on it that line up on each one. And, and one set will be normally closed. The other set will be normally open. Pretty easy to test those. As you push them, they'll change. Again, normally close, so these two will be connected, and those two will be open. And then when you push it, these two will be connected, and these two will be open. You can also use like the beep method if you flip it to, if your meter has like a beep noise, when you touch the two together. I think I was, my common was maybe just a tiny bit out there is why I wasn't getting a, a real solid reading. For those ohms yeah see that's a solid connection so it means it's closed and then you push it and it's open there's no longer a connection there this one's opposite open closed open closed same thing with so that's a good indication of a brake switch or pto switch reverse switch they're all exactly like that now a pto switch it is basically the same thing if you look at the side that says normally closed, the tab closest will be closed with the outside, which is the common. If you look at the other side, it'll tell you that it is common. The closest one here to that side that says common is the common, means, meaning it's the one that connects with the other two. So here to here, normally closed, as this side says. And then when I pop it open, it's gonna be open. It's gonna open that connection from there to there. Same thing on these other tabs. So that's open, and then when I close it, it's a closed connection between those two. Now the common will work backwards of that, so this is closed here. The common to the middle will work backwards of that. So it'll be normally open, and it'll be closed when you pull the switch. Same thing with the other rows. This one here. Because it's the common, it'll connect with the middle. So it's normally open and it's closed because I have it pulled up. It opens when I push it in again. And then this side, it only reacts with the, with the two pairs. It doesn't have the third one. So this one and this one, 
It just normally opens just like the other pairs are and closes as soon as you pull it. That switch is good. These two do not have a PTO switch, but just something good to know about how to test a PTO switch. Seat switches are a little bit different. Now there are a lot of different types of seat switches. I'm gonna show you just a couple. Now there's two different ones that look exactly the same. Again, with the normally open, normally closed thing, this says normally closed right here. That means this connection is normally closed. And when you push it, it opens the connection. That's how a lot of seat switches are. A lot of them are not. People think that, you know, if you remove the two wires at the back of the seat and t twist them together, that makes the seat think you're on it. Well, with that switch that's normally closed, that does the opposite. That's telling it that you're not sitting on it. This switch is backwards of that. It's normally open and it's closed when you sit on it. Now, if you had this switch and you twisted your wires together, that'd make you there. But I see a lot of people put the wrong switch in and it won't start when they're sitting on it. So they have no idea what's going on. Some of them have four posts like this. If you look, they have the normally closed. They have an NC on them. So if you test, sorry, normally closed from here to here. And then normally closed on the inside from here to here. Yeah, so it's the outside pair and the inside pair on this one. And then as soon as you push it, it'll be open, just like the other. So normally closed, when you push the switch, it opens. So it's got just two separate pairs, the two inside and the two outside pairs, just like the PTO switch did, just like all the other safety switches did. That should tell you pretty well how to diagnose any of these electrical switches that you find. They're all the same throughout these units, whether you have something like this or you know a PTO switch or anything like that. If your unit's not starting, we already tested that solenoid on that one. That solenoid's bad. We're going to replace it. And we're going to get this coil here flipped out because this isn't getting a good spark. So we've got the ignition coil in. That's a 595304. They call it an armature magneto. Now as we open it, we see that it is completely different of a style and what the original on there is and it's got this metal boot already installed so it's this side out on one cylinder side on the other and then it has insulation instructions basically tells you to use this to measure the gap in between the flywheel and the magnet and to go ahead and remove the old one while the magnet is not facing it for easiest results Now those are just uh, two 5 16 bolts. We'll remove the spark plug at the bottom. And again, they pinched this when they installed it. So we're gonna remove the bolts here and here and run this underneath as opposed to where it was. Now you wanna pay attention to how this goes back on. It goes just like this. So cylinder side will be down, of course, just like such. Go ahead and reinstall this real quick, the bracket. Now on these coils, I do not buy ever buy an aftermarket coil. There's just something about them. They never seem to work right whatsoever. I've had customers try to have me install them at some points in times and it just never works out right. It really doesn't. seems like no matter the situation, they just will not work like they should. So we just won't do them at all. We stopped that a long time ago. I'll clean off a little bit of this off the flywheel just because it seems like everybody gives me so much crap about it. Honestly, it's not gonna really help you or hurt you unless it's real scaly. So just a little of the surface stuff I got off should make everybody happy. All right. We've got it at the magnet there with our tag between. I like to cut it in half just so it kind of fits down in there without having to worry about the fan 
uh, makes it a little bit easier for me anyway. It says this side out on the top, that's how it should be. Get it all lined up. And I, you wanna be very careful with these bolts, making sure you're not gonna snap them off, over tighten them, anything like that. I always use just a nut driver when I do it. To me, it's a little bit of extra security knowing that, you know, I mean, even with being careful on an impact, one or two small impacts on a bolt this small could snap it off pretty easily. Get our kill wire. Now, as you're looking at this kill wire, you wanna make sure that it's not trapped. Sometimes people will trap them in between the starter and things like that. If they put a starter on, they'll pinch the wire. So make sure that it comes freely if you're moving it from the, from the other side, just to make sure it's not pinched or anything like that. And inspect it, make sure there's no bare spots or anything that could be touching metal and grounding it out either. And we've got the new plug in here. Let me go ahead and plug the plug the wire in at this point. Now I did leave this on the charger for a little bit longer just to make sure, but it did turn over this morning. Just seemed like the battery voltage was a tiny bit low. That solves that one. Everything's working well. All back up and running. Now we just gotta put the shroud back on. As you put it back on here, you're just going to want to make sure, A, that this sits to the outside as you're, as you're putting it down through the hole. If it sits to the inside, it will actually end up hitting the fan on that side. Now here at the front, these notches there's a little line of metal up in here that it sits into. So there's just a line of metal and it sits into that notch right down in here in this slot here and here. Now these are a little bit bent. They should look something like that, but this metal should sit right into that plastic here and here as you're putting it back together. Now, if you don't do that, you'll get rattling and stuff out of it. You've just got to kind of guide it as you push it down onto it. Now the rest of it should be pretty self-explanatory, I would think, just putting the bolts back in and stuff. You got them off yourself to begin with. But if you look up top, you can see how that is onto the plastic. To start with on this repair, to get the solenoid taken care of on the Craftsman, since we have it in, you wanna remove the battery cable, the negative. We've taken that off, just the one bolt, and that just, takes the circuit away so the circuit can't be completed so when we're messing with the positive over here if we touch back to ground it's not going to cause a problem Let's see if we can't get just a tiny bit closer doesn't look too bad now on the solenoid the top two are just going to be 7 16 nuts i'm going to take those right off now the solenoid we have is going to be an Oregon 33-431. Now this solenoid, the reason we use Oregon solenoids is because I feel like right when I first started, I had all kinds of problems with solenoids. Seemed like they just kept burning out no matter the situation. Once I started using Oregon ones, it seems like they were halfway decent. Not sure why that's the case. I've used them ever since and not really had any issues. Take both of those off. Pay attention to where the wires go. The one just goes to the starter. Sometimes there'll be two wires here that go to the hot side. This one only has one, but then there's two wires that go to the coil on the solenoid. At that point, we've got one bolt that's holding it in the back. We'll remove that. And that's just a 3 8 Now 
once that's removed, that side pops up and the whole thing pops up and out. It's just got a little kind of nipple on the one side. Now this one, as we take it apart, it's gonna be a little bit different. Now it has kind of the same connections, but it's set up to do multiple, multiple ways. It's set up to be a universal. So this will mount here, and then we're gonna put a bolt here to secure it. Does it really need that secondary bolt to secure it? Probably not. But we want it nice and secure in there. And this is your box of hardware for the different ways you can make it. Now, since ours has tabs on them, we've got to install these tabs on these here. That means putting your tab on each side. Your lock washers. And they're supposed to be nuts that come with them. And it doesn't look like they came with any nuts. Got another one. Let's see what this one shows as far as difference. Yeah, so it's got the nuts on the inside of this one. After I talked them up like that. <laughs> okay. Now you can install them like they should be since everything's actually here. The nuts on this one are in 11 30 seconds. You want to make sure that these are nice and tight. Otherwise, just like the uh, wiring and, and every other connection not being nice and tight, it will cause problems. That's why they put the little lock washers with them. So that should be good. And what we'll do, we'll put this in here. We'll get that back one started. It's a 3 8 on the one side. Fell down on that. All right, so I've got it started on the back side. And I'm just going to put a quarter 20 bolt on the front don't want to go down in there for some reason but it should be plenty big enough might want to thread itself actually at the bottom didn't exactly thread itself but it did thread through there and put the nut on the back side go ahead and tighten it down can't quite get onto it anymore that way all right three eighths on the back side can put our nuts go like this just like such and smash down on so you can put the leads on just the way they came off and then again just like such and down on just makes a good connection with that copper on there is I believe why they do that need a half 
bench for that. Tighten it up good. You want to hold on to the wire as you do it, and you don't want to over tighten either. Now, the reason you hold on to the wire is you don't want it trying to spin the stud at the bottom. So hold on to the wire as you turn it and tighten it down. Both of those are good and tight. Plug in our two terminals here. Now, if you use exactly the same solenoid is what was original you won't have to do any modifications or anything like that these are just universal ones we have laying around all we need to do is get the negative hook back up to be able to fire this thing right up In conclusion here this one was you know nice and easy with it just being the solenoid that was bad on it uh, voltage was coming to the solenoid the solenoid just didn't draw down to connect the voltage to the starter no big deal there whatsoever now if you're getting this same reading and if you're testing between these two when you're turning the key and that voltage is dropping you know to practically nothing between the two you could have another issue with one of the safety switches or something like that. That's that's one of the random things that does happen sometimes. And the safety switches will still kind of test good uh, and, and test good there. But as soon as you put amperage through them, they lose the connection. If that is happening and you're you know showing voltage here and your solenoid is not working and you've replaced the solenoid try jiggling your safety switches a lot of times that'll work and you'll get a connection out of them uh if that's dropping out like that you know kind of rocking them back and forth a lot of times a little bit of grass or something will get caught in one of those safety switches and it just won't make good contact but sometimes once you jiggle them you know jiggle the reverse switch or the uh, brake switch over on the other side kind of move the brake in and out sometimes that will help and it'll help you figure out which switch has actually gone bad at that point if you're having troubleshooting issues with that now i've got the um voltmeter hooked up just to the battery here it's showing 12.77 volts i know uh we just want to test the charging system and basically we just want to make sure that at full throttle after it's running for a minute, it comes up to basically 13.8 to 14.3. So it looks like it's showing about 15.3 after running for quite a few minutes there. Uh, actual voltage reading as soon as it's turned off is, you know, really right about 14, which is exactly where it should be. Everything on this tractor for all intents and purposes is all ready to go back to the customer. Hopefully this gave you a lot of insight as far as things that could be wrong with your tractor if it will not start uh, from electrical to engine issues and everything in between. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe.